been following this whole debacle, let's call it a debacle, in DC with everyone crying about the freight rates. I'm gonna read you a piece from Transportation Nation. Whether you agree with it or not, agree with me or not, that's fine, okay? But from my experience, I'm gonna put my, I'm gonna read you this article and then put my spin on it behind that. Okay, in this article, Freight Brokers Fight Back Part Two. All right, I'm not gonna read the whole article, but I will put it in the link. Okay, the head of the largest association representing third-party logistics companies is not backing down to those pushing for full rate transparency in the shipper-broker-carrier relationships and revealing why he believes they should be careful what they wish for. Okay, Robert Voltman, Transportation Intermary Associate, has been watching with keen interest the developments of this whole deal, okay? After Trump uh, spoke out during the COVID-19 national emergency, Voltman says that he, along with his members, quickly realized they were in for an unprecedented battle. We're certainly taking it seriously, he told Transportation Nation in an interview. Now, listen closely as this develops, okay, because there are things in here that's not said that should have been said, and they're probably being said somewhere else. TIA membership is comprised of a wide range of brokerages, including the biggest players in the space, have come under intense criticism during the pandemic. The furor sparked an almost three-week idiotic protest, and trucker trucking groups such as the Small Business Transportation Coalition and the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association to demand that Congress and Federal Motor, Motor Carrier Safety take action and crack down. All right, let's move along. The controversy in D.C. protests has been led to the Department of Justice into alleged violations of the 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act, which criminalizes corporations colluding for the purpose of price fixing. Truckers are kind of wanting to collude themselves in a way, as some people are asking for a 250 minimum rate. That's collusion. Okay, in part one, Boltman dismissed such allegations. We've done not done anything, he said. Let the Justice Department do their thing. If they don't want... Okay, now here is a, is a slippery slope, okay? Well, it's not slippery. It's just totally illegal. At the core of the outrage directed at 3PLs in recent weeks is the lack of disclosure of freight rates paid by the shipper to the broker and widespread practices deployed by many brokers requiring carriers to waive their rights to know. Okay, remember that, waive their rights to know. Critics argue brokers are seeking to hide transaction records in order to conceal profit margins of as much as 60%. Now, we all know that the original video that gets the 60% quote was a lie video. It was just a total lie. Everyone knows this by now even if you're not saying it. Despite the fact brokers are required to comply with the now famous 49 CFR 371-3 provision. Now, a lot of brokers will make you sign your right away when you sign their contract. Now, if you sign that contract, that does not mean that you have to abide by it. You can still request them tell you. And if they don't, you can sue them. It's that simple. And they will have to tell you. You cannot put something in a contract that is illegal and have it upheld in court. Dave Voltman went on the record with TNN in an attempt to dispel these notions. Most shippers' contracts today have strict confidentiality rules in them. So the reason the broker asked the carrier to waive that is because if they don't waive the right, they can't move the shipper's freight. Regardless of what he says, you have the right to know. To illustrate his point, he posed two examples. Does Coke and Pep want Pepsi to know what their cost of transportation is? No. Does Procter and Gamble want Johnson & Johnson to know? Of course not. Okay, Boatman argues that since deregulation in 1980, shippers are not under price transparency regulations and 
point three now needs to be modernized because it essentially places an undue burden on brokers. This is a fact. Shippers want their numbers hidden, okay? Why? Because shippers insist on this non-disclosure. So the brokers have to sign the same agreement more or less. Slightly different. Brokers have little choice but to agree to these terms or they don't get loads. Okay. Now, I'm just I'm going to scan up through here. You keep reading if you so desire. You can read it down below. But uh, what now I'm going to go ahead on over here and give you my point of view. Now, from my point of view, what you're going to say is, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, TRC. You're leased to a company. That don't mean I don't have plans to start up another authority with trucks. I can stay here and still do that, right? Now, let's move on to it. It wasn't mentioned in this article. He mentioned that it, it may be further down, I didn't get that far, that it will put owner operators out of business, and it will, because everyone operates on a different margin. If you take trucks and put them into three categories, new trucks, used trucks, and paid for trucks, those are three different categories. Now, in the new truck category, Everyone is pretty, not every, well, ex excluding trucks like mine, everyone is in a pretty well same cost, right? Same operating cost for their trucking business. Other than insurance and how they drive, the price of their truck is that they're close, within 20 or 30 cents. Now, the other thing that affects that is how you run your household how much money you pay yourself, right? So where I live in, in, a, in a place where my cost, you know, I can I can run my truck for $1.60. Now that's my truck. If it was a regular truck, I could I could run it for $1.30 on a new truck. But could you? I don't know. And that's including my household cost. If I lived in New York or somewhere like that, with you know higher property taxes or whatever everything goes up so now you're looking at, at the broker's transparency and you're going oh look this is what he's going to make off of it and you see the bids coming in you can always undercut <clears throat> excuse me undercut your buddy because our biggest enemy in this market isn't the brokers or any the, our biggest enemy is ourselves as truck drivers that's the way it should be. When they walked into the White House, it was a setup, and they asked for it. They made a nuisance of themselves on Pennsylvania Avenue, and they got what they asked for. And when when they went before Trump's aide, and he said, "Well, let's just make it tr broker transparency on the front of the load," they stepped in it. And, if the, and they will probably get this. Since the Trump administration brought that up, that's what they're going to get. And when they get that, if they can't run on $2 a uh, if they have to have a minimum of $2 a mile, the people that can run on $1.30 a mile and still make profit are going to take all their loads. Right? Now, I'm going to switch you over to... James Rogers. He had a much better proposal. I do not 100% agree with it, but it's something to build on that I think can still work because this kind of emergency will come around again. Event, you know, maybe not in our lifetime, but if it does, it'd be nice to have something there to to fall back on. It's already in place. Okay. Now let's listen to James. <laughs> Uh, it's about this document right here, okay? This is a copy of the two-page document that I have submitted to Congress as far as the proposal goes. What this proposal is going to encompass is it's mainly targeting the independent owner-operators and small fleets of the trucking industry, but it can also be used, and we are going to implement a part for company drivers. We're still just trying to work out on that of how we can ensure that the companies are going to do that for you, the if the miles. We were looking for what could we ver give them as a hard number, verifiable number, and the number we could come up with is the IFTA miles. All right, so the, t the proposal is going to take effect basically when the president put the country into a state of emergency. 
And from that point, it's going to carry on until he officially removed us. So, for example, if we were actually put into a state of emergency on the 1st of April, and then we were removed the 15th of May, whatever, if the miles, if you stayed out here on the road, you know, answering the call of the country, running relief loads, supplies, or whatever it may be, we're asking that you be compensated $1.50 per mile. So a good example of that would be if you ran 30,000 miles over the course, 30,000 tracked IFTA miles over the course of that period, that would be potentially $45,000 that could be used to help you recover lost revenue. Because we know that we all ran at some sort of a loss. Okay, we had to depend on lenders or whoever to help us get through this period. The stimulus packages that have been put in place completely missed us and we're all well aware of that. All right, there were a few, there was a handful that were lucky and got it or they were able to get it and get approved for it depending on how their pay structure was set up. But for the most part, it missed, the, it missed us in this side of the industry. Now, with that being said, the other thing that we're going to try to get them to implement as well is to use this as a tax credit advance. So basically, if you qualified for the IFTA miles and got that $45,000, but yet you were able to maintain your business and stay in business to support the country in the future, at the end of the tax year, that money that was given to you to get you through as far as a relief effort goes will become a tax credit. You won't have to pay any kind of income tax on it. And that's all included in this proposal. From the time the, the country was put into a national emergency situation until when the, the president removed us, we'll take the IFTA miles, whether you're an independent owner operator or even a company truck, can, they have to track that. We're requesting $1.50 a mile on the independent owner operator side. We're still working on the number to submit for the company driver. It could be anywhere from 15 cent, 30, 25 cent, or even 30 cent a mile. But we got to see how we can get the companies to enforce that because we want to make sure that that money gets to the drivers. Hence the reason why we're looking at it is trying to propose it as a tax credit advance to where company drivers at the end of the year, you could submit that on your taxes and you could receive basically a tax credit and that money comes back to you at the end of the year one way or another. So in short, we're trying to do this to help the industry. This is an opportunity for us to bring everybody together as one, it's an opportunity to get immediate assistance of what is needed and hopefully we can keep the country moving because they, we answered their call when they needed us. Now we're asking that they answer our call. Y'all have a good day and stand against all odds.